are listening to Light Hearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. Today is April 7th, 2024, and this is episode 272 of Light Hearted. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. In a few minutes, we're going to hear an interview with Gene Davis, director of the Coast Guard Museum Northwest in Seattle, Washington. First, uh, we are recording this on April 2nd. By the way, Michelle, do you have a good April Fool's Day? <laughs> of course, the students at school were trying to get me with all the things, but yes, it was good. Did they did they catch you on anything? Did no, they fool you? No, no, no. Pretty hard to fool you, I think. Yeah, I think so. Been around the block a little bit. Yeah, I didn't play any jokes on anybody, but Charlotte, my wife, always gets me good with something every April Fool's Day this year. I, w- I went out and took a walk after lunch, right? And mm-hmm. as I'm walking back, I'm thinking, what is that in my shoe? I felt like something, maybe a bug was biting the bottom of my foot or something. And I came in and took off my shoe and I saw what I thought was a big spider in the inside my shoe. And I thought, and I, and I yelled, <laughs> I kind of... Not quite screamed, but I, I kind of yelled, and I could hear Charlotte laughing from the other room, and uh, I really thought a spider had bitten the bottom of my foot, and then I realized, of course, it was a plastic spider. So, oh, so that's she, funny. <laughs> that's so pretty got, funny. That's yeah, clever. She got her laugh at my expense, but I got over it. Back to our uh, show here. So as we speak, uh, another storm is moving toward us here on the New Hampshire seacoast. It looks like this will be a late season snowstorm for a lot of people. I think there's going to be as much as maybe around a foot of uh, wet snow where you are in Rochester, New Hampshire, Michelle. Yep. Actually, Rochester right now is in the um, 18 to 24 inch range. So, really? Yes. Oh, that uh, th- recently changed. Um, the math teacher that I work with is sort of um, a meteorology nerd, and he's been checking all of the different models for days for a few days now and he just sent us the latest predictions showing Mm. we're in the 18 to 24 inch range oh wow Uh, and it's supposed to be heavy wet snow so yes good luck with that and uh sounds like you might get a day or two off from school that's what i'm thinking which is you know typically great but right now our last day of school is friday june 15th so if we get another snow day or two that puts us back you know coming yeah. back the following week and I have meetings scheduled on Thursday that I'm going to have to reschedule now. And yeah, it's kind of a Throw- nuisance at this time of the year. Right. Yeah. <laughs> kind of throws a monkey wrench into things. Yes. But as far as the storm goes, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be bad, but th- I guess the good news is that the wind is coming from a different direction than those uh, very damaging storms we had in mid January that damaged Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. This time the the winds will be coming from the northeast, but still they are talking about high seas not far from Portsmouth Harbor and some possible coastal flooding and things like that. So it's a little scary, uh, especially I think Thursday they're talking about. Yeah. Well, hope for the best. uh, Yes, we will. Yeah, uh, because Portsmouth Harbor Light is a little precarious right now. We don't want things to get worse. And I will mention uh, that the Coast Guard, uh, people have heard us talk about this before. So I think a lot of our listeners know that the Coast Guard actually owns Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse, and they have told us they'll be carrying out repairs. We just don't know when yet. So hopefully, hopefully soon. Yes, Uh, I'm hoping that that happens on the the sooner end. That would be great. So. I concur. And uh, still hoping we might get in some uh, tours this season if things go right. And we'll definitely keep our listeners updated about that. For now, let's go to today's interview. So please help me out, Michelle. Sure, Jeremy. The Coast Guard Museum Northwest, located on an active Coast Guard base on the waterfront of Seattle, Washington, opened in 1976. The location served as the Seattle Port of Embarkation and was one of the U.S. Army's busiest terminals. Tens of thousands of American soldiers and seamen deployed from there during World War II and the Korean War. Today, the museum serves as a showcase for some of the Coast Guard's most important stories, lessons, and accomplishments, and the museum's archives are open to researchers. The museum has tens of thousands of photos, as well as antiques and artifacts that date back to the beginnings of the Coast Guard. The archives are full of blueprints of ships and various items dating back to World War II. 
Jean Davis was the planning officer for the Coast Guard District and helped launch the museum in 1976. Jean was also instrumental in setting up Base Seattle when the Coast Guard took over the site from the Army. After retiring as a captain from the Coast Guard in 1978, Jean went to work at the museum. For the past 46 years, he's given tours and carried out research for countless numbers of people. Jean is also the president of the organization that operates the museum as a nonprofit organization. In 2012, he was awarded the Coast Guard Distinguished Public Service Award for his many years of dedication. My friend Chad Kaiser, who is the general manager of the new Dungeness Light Station and also a certified lampist, has known Dean Davis for years and he helped to arrange this interview. I recently spent more than a week in the Seattle area uh, attending some U.S. Lighthouse Society meetings. In the middle of my stay, Chad and I took a ferry to Seattle and met with Gene at the museum. You'll hear Chad taking part in the interview at times. So let's listen to our conversation with Gene Davis now. I am here at the Coast Guard Museum Northwest on Coast Guard Base Seattle, and I'm speaking with Captain Gene Davis, U.S. Coast Guard retired, who is the director of this museum. And uh, also with us today is my friend Chad Kaiser, general manager of New Dungeness Light Station, also a lampist or Fresnel lens expert. And Chad had a lot, a lot to do with kind of setting up this whole thing. So thank you for that, Chad. Uh, and also, uh, Gene, first of all, thank you so much for showing. Uh, I know Chad's been here multiple times. I've never been here before. You showed us around the museum and showed us the what I would call the inner sanctum of the archives downstairs, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Gina. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. You haven't seen the warehouse. <laughs> well, maybe next time. I don't know about the time today. There's so much great stuff here. It's fantastic. So let's talk about your Coast Guard career in the, uh, the days before the museum started. Where are you from originally, Gene? Born in Marysville, Kansas, 50 miles from the center of the 48 states. So what led somebody who grew up in the middle of the country to join the Coast Guard? Well, this was in uh, 1949, and um, I graduated in 48, and this I joined in February of 49. And uh, people were joining the service, some of our friends, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. So another friend and I, since all our friends were joining the Marines and the, uh, Coast, and the uh, Army or something, we decided to join the Coast Guard, and we couldn't even spell it. But... Uh, we went to boot camp together, and uh, he stayed in and retired, and I stayed in and retired. And you have been uh, part of the Coast Guard for how many years? As of February uh, this year, uh, 75. Congratulations. That's uh, pretty impressive. So when you first joined the Coast Guard, where did you do boot camp, and what happened after that? Boot camp was in Cape May, New Jersey, and uh, we took a bunch of tests there, IQ tests, and I qualified to go to uh, ET school, electronics ET technician school. Mm -hmm. Came out of there, went on a ship out of Boston, made my first trip up to the North Atlantic, came back, and I was on that ship just one year. I got orders to go to, I was actually two years, excuse me, and I got orders to go to advanced ET school. Mm -hmm. And while there, I applied for RCA Institute, because it was something new, and uh, I came out of there, and I was only out of that school two months, and I went to RCA Institute for two years, and I was in electronics after that. So what sorts of things did you do as a, what, what's, the, what's the proper title? Electronics technician. The first ship I went had uh, air search, surface search radars, sonar, uh, two radio rooms, radio beacon, and several other things. And those were, those were for me to maintain. Mm -hmm. And I, I took care of all of them. Then I, when I went to advanced school, I came back to the same one because they wanted me back aboard. Okay. And, but I was only there two months before I went to another school. So uh, yeah. after I got out, I, w I became an officer. And uh, we were at the time, we were building Loran stations all over the Pacific. We had a total of 50 Loran stations being built from the mm -hmm. Philippines, Japan, and what have you. Yeah. For our listeners who might not know, what is Loran? Well, it doesn't exist anymore because they have what they call GPS. But it's a predecessor to GPS. Uh, Loran was developed during World War II, and it was very highly secret. Nobody knew about it, and we didn't start using it for civilian use until we, after the war. Loran is a system where you have two stations, one's a master and one is a slave. You measure the time difference in millions of a second of when you heard the master and the slave. Okay. Okay? And that will put you on a line. Then you take, the ma take a master, usually it's a double master, 
and he and another slave off in another direction, and you uh, take a time difference between them, the master and the slave, mm-hmm. and where the two lines cross, that's where you are. Okay. They had had the ran a they, while I was gone for a while. It was uh, ran a, but um, I had a Loran station in uh, Miho, Japan, and it was built there during the Korean War. I got back and I went on a ship out of New Bedford. And I was in there 15 months, and I got we were out at sea off Cape Cod, and I got a message, be in headquarters Monday morning. Mm-hmm. I had to jump ship out, out of Cape Cod and get buses back to New Bedford, and, and Sunday Sunday I drove to uh, Washington D.C. We were coming out with a new system. The new system was very low frequency, 100 kc. It penetrates the water. So submarines do not have to put up an antenna and show. And uh, it's it's good for about 2,000 miles. And the accuracy, you're not measuring a millionth of a second. You're measuring one thousandth of a millionth of a second. Uh-huh. And uh, Loran, L-O-R-A-N, uh, is short for long-range navigation. Right? L-O, long, R for range. A-N is agent navigation. It's long-range agent ra- navigation. Agent navigation, yeah. You installed a lot of those, right? I didn't install them. Other people did. I was okay. in charge. You were in charge, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Not literally installed, but uh, but I was buying the equipment and stuff at, at headquarters. I was stationed in headquarters. Yeah. And uh, headquarters. Where, where are we talking Washington, about? Washington D.C. in Washington. Okay. Yeah, the Coast Guard headquarters. Uh, but I was in charge of the Ran A when the Ran C. I took that over because the guy that had the Ran A went into the other Ran C. Bin. But uh, later, late 58, we put a chain, a chain of Loran stations in the uh, Caribbean. Mm-hmm. And I did go down and put them on the air. I think Bahamas was one of those places? Is there... uh, yeah. Uh, San Salvador, mm-hmm. we had a station. Uh, South Caicos. Uh, and uh, Puerto yeah. Rico. What did you do later on? Well, uh, I was in um, the... Um, H Navigation Branch when I went there in 58 and then I went from there and they created a new uh, billet and uh, I became a, spent four years working out of the Brooklyn Supply Center I was assistant chief inspector for buying equipment we usually had 40 or 50 million dollars worth of equipment which was a lot of the, buying the RAND station equipment buying radars buying radio equipment and uh, I was assistant chief I had about we had about 10 sometimes as much as 15 inspectors, warrant officers, mostly. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would go with them on a new contract and get set it up and and what have you. But then we had to monitor them, and if they had any problems, they called us. And I had a, I was working for a commander. He took half of them, and I took half of them. Okay. They kept us busy. Yeah. Yeah. You also were on a ship on the coast of California. Is that correct? I was on – I was executive officer on the uh, – of oil, which is 205. We were the biggest ship north of San Francisco, about 25 rescues a year. And where were you based? Eureka. You were Okay, Eureka. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, I was there for two years. And um, one day, I, the quartermaster called me and said, there's a phone call for you. So I went down, and uh, there's a friend of mine. He had a, used to have a desk beside me in, in the headquarters, and uh, he was senior to me. And he said, Gene, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm uh, chief of electronics now. Yeah, how would you like to be chief of the branch we were both in? Okay, <laughs> so I went back and became it, and it was all the H navigation, and I was in charge of the um, electronics and of automation of all the lighthouses. I made sure that they were being monitored right and everything. And what kind of equipment was used for monitoring at that time period? So what we did is monitored whether it was on or not. Oh, okay. And when it went on and then off and when this fog signal worked. Out here at uh, Point No Point, there used to be a cable across to, and I forget the name of it, to the lighthouse. Double Bluff, I believe. Double Bluff. Yeah. And that got canceled. So I, I was electronics officer in the district, and I had telephone men. So I said, can you take care of this? Well, we didn't replace that. We went over and put a telephone in. Over at Table Bluff, or table, Double Bluff? Double Bluff, yeah. Double, double Bluff. And uh, point, no point, we could dial up that number, push a button, 
the light, the light would go on, in the, or the fog signal would go on. The light would go on automatically. But he could tell whether the light was on in the fog, and it would turn the fog signal on. But this was electronic equipment that was used to monitor whether the lights were on or off, and a lot of it was... And turn them on and off. And turn them on and off, and a lot of it was... You, it used the telephone system to do that? Only there. Okay. Otherwise, it was transmitted uh, uh, later. But it was transmitted by radio. Like Cape Flattery, we had a contact going back. It was, but there was a radio. It wasn't a telephone line. It was a radio contact. Are you saying radio contact to a, to a person or directly? No, to a, like um, Destruction Island was monitored in La Push. So they knew that that light was on or not. They, they couldn't see it. And that's, what, 15 miles away? It's about that, yeah. 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 But they knew if if they knew, can I tell you a story? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, all we what's had, what's the how is it rated? Is it is it well, G it's, rated? It, but it's, and I'll do it quickly. There's a guy we had it unmanned, and there was a guy went out in his boat and he tried to land on the island, which is the son of a gun, and he lost his boat. So we had one we had the light and one building, and half of the building was generators. And half of the building was a room with four bunks in it, a kitchenette, and a refrigerator with food in it and shelving with food on them. So if you got, were out there working, you can get it. This guy went through all the food. He was about five, five days. And then finally what he did, he went over and turned the generators off. He was smart enough to do that, which the push, oh, something's happened. They came out and found the guy. Well, I had my people go out and put a sign up. If you're lost on the island, step in the door, and there's a phone. Pick up the phone, and it rings automatically. <laughs> He'd spent there five or six days and hadn't used it. Wow. <laughs> he was stranded on the island five or six days, and there was a telephone that he could pick up, and he didn't. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he didn't have a dime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, it was a pay pay one. It was, it was just you lift it. Yeah. I didn't even have to dial. You just lift it. And it, it rings it back at the watch standards. The reason that I really enjoy talking to you, especially about things like this, is it's a bit of technology that not many people know about. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have done research or have read books about classic lighthouse technology, oil burning lamps yeah. and fog bells and things along those lines. And some other people are aware of what's going on now with the LED transition and battery backups and things like that. But you worked during a period of time that was almost directly in between those it was a technologies. Transition. Yes. And it was a transition area. And that technology didn't stay around for a long time, but was very ingenious in the way that what was new technology at that time was, was utilized. And I think that's a, a hole in information that people have have worked on in the past. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I interviewed a guy recently named Harry Duvall who was involved in lighthouse automations in the north in the first district in the northeast mm -hmm. for many years. He worked on virtually every lighthouse in Maine, et cetera, et cetera. And again yeah, again it's an unsung part of uh, part of the Coast Guard and part of our history. So we're talking when you were involved with the automations, that was you're talking sixties, early seventies? Uh, it was, uh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I, I was, I came here in 70, so it was in 67, 68, 69, somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah. Did you get to know any of the lighthouse keepers at that time when the stations were being automated? No, I wasn't doing it. You weren't was, doing it personally. I, I was the boss. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, okay, that makes sense, yeah. So I, but they were doing it. The only trip I, uh, well, I, I came out to the West Coast once and visited uh, Destruction Island and some and a couple others. Then I went down to, to San Francisco and to, I, I, I got to go to the Fairlands, and also landed on just outside, just outside of San Francisco Bridge. Uh, well, that would be the Fairlawn Islands around. No, there. no, no. There's one right to, within a mile. Oh, Mile Rock. Right, but they'd already cut it off and right. automated. We went in with a hell. I got to fly under and over the Golden Gate Bridge that day. <laughs> And the helicopter dropped two of us off and went off for about a half an hour and then came back and picked us up. But then we went down through a trap door just to see what it was doing. Yeah. And I got to go to Fairline Line that day. 
Uh-huh. I've seen that stump of uh, the uh, Mile Rock Lighthouse there. It's just, well, they used to have a tower on yeah. it with a, everything. Spark plug type lighthouse. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then I went down to uh, Los Angeles area and checked them all out. Yeah. Uh, Gene, let's move on to the, the museum. First, the location here on well, base Seattle. What was it before it was a Coast Guard base? This was an Army base. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was bu- this base was built in 1925. That building was built in 1925. It was a Pacific Steamship Company. And uh, then in 1939, the, the Army took it over, and it became a port of embarkation for uh, World War II and Korea. And then in 1975, we took it over. It's still part of my career, because I was here four years as an electronics officer. Then I became two years as the planning officer for the district. Mm-hmm. And I was in charge of taking this over. And one day... Uh, another commander came into my office, and we were going to tear this building down. And uh, he came in, and he said, wouldn't it be great to have a museum there or something? And I said, yeah, but I'm rewriting some stuff right now. We've got to decide. So we went to see the admiral, and he agreed. And so in 1976, we got, I can't remember whether it was 5000 or $10,000 for a centennial project for the district. And this was a centennial project. And we opened up with a lot of easels with pictures on them because we didn't have any of this stuff Mm -hmm. and we still collect stuff you retired in 78 eight eight. yeah but the museum opened on july for august 4th 1976 76 yeah yeah. august 4th is our birthday the The coast guard was created in august 4th 1790 oh that's appropriate yeah that's why it was so it'll be the 50th anniversary of this museum in a couple of years you could have some special celebration for that (laughs) probably uh, yeah we had a celebration here uh, on Saturday, and it was for the bear. It was 150 years old. Okay. Well, since you mention it, it's right next to us here, the model of the bear. Tell us, tell us what, was, what was the bear? Well, the bear was b- built by a Scots- Scotchman, and the Scotchman built four of them to, to do sealing, seals, S-E-A, killed seals off the uh, Canadian coast yep. in the Atlantic. And uh, he bought he bought four of them. He built the bear, the tiger, the leopard, and the lion. They all had that kind of name. Well, in 1881, there was a, a guy named Greeley went up with the, the total of 25 people went up above the Arctic Circle, in Greenland, and were going to stay there as much as three years. They had food for three years. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, that was in 81. In 82, a ship was going up and going to take supplies in and see, check on them, and they couldn't make it because of the ice. It was in 82. In 83, they uh, tried, and they couldn't make it up. Uh, the guys had enough food for three years, supposedly. So the next year, they bought the bear. The Navy bought the bear. It's not an icebreaker, but it's ice-resistant. It's about 12 inches thick mm-hmm. of ironwood. And so she went up and rescued them. There were seven people still alive, and they um, brought them back. One of them died on the way home. So that's how she became famous. But then the Navy didn't want it anymore, so we, the Coast Guard, the Revenue Cutter Service got it. But then starting in 1885, she um, went north every year and went up the west coast of Alaska. They had a doctor and a dentist aboard and a federal judge, and they did everything for that time up until 1927. In 1997 or 98, she went up and she'd come back and she got here on the 22nd of November mm-hmm. and she stopped in Seattle and there was a message from head, from the president actually. There's over 200 whalers stuck up a Point Point Barrow. The ships are sunk and they're there. So the bear went back up and they couldn't go all the way because of the ice. Mm-hmm. But they got out, they got off, and it was 1,500 miles, and it took them 99 days until March uh, 19th or 20th. And anyway, it took them 99 days to get there, but they, on the way up, they bought reindeer herds, and they took food in and saved them all. And it's called a Great Overland Rescue, but it was done by the bear. And she, um, Admiral Bird took her to the South Pole a couple times. Then she came back. In World War II, the Coast Guard and the Navy used her because to go from Boston to Greenland, where we had bases up there, and they went back and forth. And she ended up in Nova Scotia. And in 19, 
63, they were towing her back to uh, Philadelphia to become a restaurant, and she didn't like it, so she sunk. They finally found her within the last year. Wow. What a career she that had a, She had a career, yes. Yeah. And we have a, uh, some 370-footers now, about 10 or 15 of them. And uh, she's the lead one. The bear, the new bear. It's the bear class. Bear class. Oh, right, okay, the bear class. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I knew a, a little bit about it, but thanks. I didn't know all, all that. That's. Uh, and that model is about as good as you can get. It was done by a 70-year-old guy that used to work on one of the shipyards over here. It's a beauty. It was, it, first, it was our first model. It looks pristine. Has it been restored or anything? No? No. It's gorgeous. You got a lot of amazing ship models in here. And that there is an ensign, a Coast Guard ensign. You know what a Coast Guard ensign is? Do you want me to tell you? Tell us. <laughs> okay. We started out, uh, the reason the Coast Guard got started is because uh, people were bypassing the customs and, and not paying the import duties. So they needed some uh, police to do it. Yep. So we formed the Revenue Cutter Service. And there were 10 cutters. There were 10 customs officers on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, so we started chasing those people. Now we chase drug people and now all kinds of stuff. Yep. But uh, uh, we got started with that. And then we did, uh, in uh, 1915, we joined with the Life Saving Service and changed the name to Coast Guard. Yep. And the main reason is because... There was a war coming in Europe, and we were going to get in it. And the government wanted a military control of the lifeboat stations. In 1939, we took over the lighthouses, so we would have military control of the lighthouses. Right, another you war follow? brewing. Yes. We started planning for the war about 37. As a matter of fact, the Army bought this, got this in 39, and that, they were planning for the war. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this ensign on the oh, wall, what's the story with that? Well, in, in 1797... Because nobody stopped when they saw the American flag on our boat, the president authorized us to sign one with 16 vertical stripes. There were 16 states at the time, mm -hmm. and the coat of arms, which is those things have changed. But this is like carrying a police badge. Mm -hmm. And at the time, in the, when it was done in, in 1797, it was a $100 fine to fly it on anything but a Coast Guard revenue cutter service. You know. Yeah. Uh, First revenue cutter was built about a half hour south of where I live in Newburyport, Massachusetts. So they, Massachusetts was the name of it. Right. They claim to be the birthplace of the Coast Guard because of that. So one story that I've often heard is about the revenue cutter service rush. Oh, yeah. Do you know the story about... I just wrote about it. You did? I'll give you a copy. <laughs> so... What's the, what's the story, we, we had a Coast Guard the, the well-known story about the rush? We had a Coast Guard cut. Well, the thing of it is, they, they, they went up there every spring because it was illegal to do certain, so many seals and stuff. It's illegal to sealing. But there was, I know there were British there and some other countries. They would come in and do the sealing, but they'd do it before the, the rush was ever done. So it, it, we, it's felt that it started the term, get busy and do it and get it done before the rush. <laughs> you follow me? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, but, it, it, yeah. You wanted to beat the rush. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought it was to beat rush hour. <laughs> no, no, it was to beat the rush. I, I didn't use the right term here, but, yeah, to beat the rush. Yeah, the general story that I've heard is as the rush was coming into town, people wanted to beat the rush out of town because <laughs> they wanted to leave before the U.S. government justice Arrived. Well, that's that's true too. Yeah, it's a, like I told you, we have a doctor and a dentist aboard, but if a federal judge wasn't available, the captain of the ship became a federal judge. But we were the government up all up on the west coast of Alaska. So we're sitting here in the the main hall of the museum, and directly across from me, thirty or so feet from me, is a beautiful fourth order Fresnel lens on display, uh, and that's definitely one of the big attractions here in the museum. Where did that lens come from? And I know that this is something that Chad knows a little bit about, too. So, But, Gene, where, where, where's that lens from? We found it out on the beach. You found <laughs> it on the beach? <laughs> as soon as we automated uh, New Dungeness. Dungeness. It's New Dungeness because it's supposed to be like the one in, in England. England. I've been to the one in England. Have you? Yeah. But um, when we automated it, we took that off and put a, the lens that's in it now. And uh, it came here, and it's been here ever since. 
I went out to New Dungeness with Chad and a couple other people two days ago. It's uh, my first time out there. What a what a great place that is. So yeah. beautiful. You've been out there, Gene, probably. I've been in light, every lighthouse every, from San Francisco North. Uh-huh. That's a lot of lighthouses. There's also another lighthouse-related item over here that relates to the early history of Alki Point in Seattle, right? Old Lantern. Old oh, Lantern. Yeah, that yeah. was the lantern on the stake until uh, 1913, I think, it, that she went to finished it. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was the lighthouse originally. And uh, actually, it was stolen from out there. And we got it back just about the time we were opening this place up. We got it back. The FBI had it, caught the guys that stole it. He got some time, and we got their lantern. But uh, uh, so it's been there ever since. Yeah. And we had a post made, so it's a post lantern. <laughs> Looks beautiful. Do you polish things like that in this museum? We haven't done much since COVID, but uh, and people don't put keep stop putting their hands on it. Donna. Yeah, yeah. Well, it but looks really nice. I just I just started trying again the other day. We, we I got to get the right right stuff to. Yeah. No, it looks old that way. It looks really clean to me. Well, it's basically clean, but it's not. It's got fingerprints on. It. You also have at least one lighthouse service clock. I just did a segment on the podcast about Chelsea clocks, lighthouse service clocks. This isn't a Chelsea. It's not a Chelsea. It's a Howard. What it is, uh, we got it. Uh, one of the first things we got when we opened up, we have the documentation. It was a, uh, built in 1858, but in 1876, they had a centennial exposition in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. and this was there in a lighthouse they'd built for the World's Fair type thing. And uh, that was in uh, 1876. And August 4th, 1976, it's here, and it's going to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did take it and get it cleaned and reworked it for 100 bucks or something recently, but yeah. it's, I, it, w- it holds good time. They're good clocks. Yeah. There aren't a whole lot of lighthouse service clocks anymore, and you've got two of them. No, you can't have one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, you want to spare. Come on. Um, <laughs> There's right next to me here, there's a case right behind Eugene. There's a case about uh, Douglas Monroe. There's also a uh, picture of him in the other room over here. And who, who was Douglas Monroe? Douglas Monroe was a young guy uh, from Cleallum, which is about 90 miles east of here. And he joined the Coast Guard in 1939. He ended up uh, uh, training for the war, and he got involved in several things. But then in the Battle of Guadalcanal, he was in charge of... Uh, 25 landing craft that put a battalion of Marines ashore. Well, there was a battalion of Marines that were supposed to come from the backside to the shore, and they were going to surround the Japanese. They didn't make it. So the people he put ashore were in trouble. The Japanese were between them and the water. So a destroyer would fire into the Japanese with five-inch guns, and the Marines would run into that area. They fired below them, they'd run it, and they finally got to the beach, and he got them he got the well the people that they could get off and everything that weren't dead or something like that. Mm-hmm. They got him off, and um, as they were leaving, he was on the last boat to come in, and uh, he was killed by a mach- machine gun fire. Mm-hmm. And he was 22 years old, I think. So. He was just going on 22. Yeah. Yeah. And then his mother joined the Coast Guard. He got the medal from President Roosevelt. She did. Uh huh. And uh, posthumous Medal of Honor. Yes. I have every all his stuff is in my safe. Okay. Locked up. Anything we haven't touched on, like if you were showing somebody around the museum here and you had uh, not, you know, didn't have all day and you wanted to show them highlights, what haven't we mentioned that you would call a real well, highlight? Well, I got the picture of the NC-4, and the NC-4 was a plane built in uh, 1918, uh, 19, and she flew in 1919. Okay. It was the first plane to fly across the Atlantic, and the pilot was a Coast Guardsman. There First was, plane to fly across the Atlantic. He was the pilot. It had six people on it. Five were Navy, and the pilot was Selmer Stone, a Coast Guard pilot, the Coast Guard pilot number one. But during World War One, we had integrated with the Navy. We had people going on Navy ships with Coast Guard guys on it, mm-hmm. and what have you. And um, he went. He integrated, but he integrated at the Coast Guard, or the Navy headquarters in Washington D.C. And in 1918, as soon as the war was over, all our people come back, but not Elmer Stone. The Navy wanted to keep him, and he did that flight. Mm-hmm. But uh, we didn't get him back till about 20 or 21. Yeah. And um, what it was, he designed and d- developed, tested, and installed the first uh, catapults on aircraft carriers. 
so he was one of our, he was one of my heroes. Yeah. Yeah. But he was the first to pilot. Most mm. people say Lindbergh. Yeah, but first he was the solo. First to solo. Right. Yeah, that was what's he twenty seven or something. Yeah, but yeah, in twenty seven. But this was uh, eight years before. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Uh, there's, there's one of the stories. Well, how did they navigate? You, you want to? Loran? <laughs> no, that's before <laughs> Loran. Well, they they flew from Brooklyn to Newfoundland to the Azores to Portugal because they couldn't do it all in one shot because of fuel, and so. They were, but between uh, Newfoundland and the Azores, how did they navigate? The Navy had a ship every 50 miles. Oh, okay. You, they f- kept flying over the ships, and they turned the lights on <laughs> at night, and that's how they got across. Before we started the interview here, you took us downstairs into your archives. Uh, like I said, the inner sanctum. I felt really, I felt very privileged to to get to see that. Well, we uh, waited to get the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Charges to the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Okay. So are the archives open to researchers? Uh, yeah, I don't loan books. Mm-hmm. If they want to come in and sit down and look at the books. or if, Most of our stuff is correspondent. Um, yeah. I've, we've done research for people in uh, Scotland, Spain, Australia. Uh, they come and want certain information about. Mm-hmm. And uh, So, yeah, we have the answer. We just have to look it up. Yeah. So you do most of the research for people. Really. We do, yeah. Yeah, you, and you're, yeah. You're all volunteers, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Nobody is paid to work in this museum. No. Yeah. I we pay by my gas and by the stuff <laughs> I buy for it. I I pay, I pay to be. You there. pay the Coast Guard. You know what it does for me? It's, it keeps me alive. Mm-hmm. You got to have something to do when you get old. So let me ask you, does the museum, do you accept donations of Coast Guard artifacts and photographs? Uh, how many did we get last week? I don't <laughs> <laughs> We still get something. Some of them are trivial. Uh, some of them we take. Somebody says, uh, I always remember years ago, uh, a friend of mine died. He was a commander, and his wife wanted to... Uh, Give me his uniform, and I, we didn't need it because we got uniforms we haven't used yet. Yeah, so over I mean, in the, the warehouse. uniform collection is amazing. Yeah. Well, you haven't seen them over okay. in the warehouse. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I said it to take it. She was worried about it going to. Uh, this was years ago, uh, going to the United Giver or someplace, and uh, Salvation Army, and ended up on some hippie. <laughs> <laughs> so we took it, but otherwise we we don't take everything all the time. But yeah. we, we take things just to preserve them and make people happy sometimes. Mm-hmm. A lot of photographs on the wall, but do you have a huge uh, photo collection behind the scenes as well? Probably about 30,000. 30,000, that's pretty significant. <laughs> Is, are they cataloged? Can you find, if somebody asks for a, yeah? It's all on the computer. Fantastic. I got to, might want to ask you about a couple of things, see if you have anything. Okay. Well, that's great. And if people contact you, contact information is available on the internet, and they can, if you're, to yeah. do research, they can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We don't loan books. Right. In case somebody they, wants to know. they got to come in and read the books. So how do, if people do want to visit the museum, how do they do that? They can't just pull up their drive up and come yeah, in? Sure. Well, the, almost, yeah. But the hours does, were open, and you drive up, and have, if you have a photo ID card, you know, like a driver's license, that's all you need. Yeah, just check in at the gate to the station. Yeah, and, but I have to go escort them in. Yeah. Except in, if they're ex-military, they have a, They can come in with their uh, ID cards and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Another thing that Chad just and I found out about today is that you're also an artist. You paint, right? You have for a yeah. long time. Yeah. Since, yeah. You, since you were a kid, you were saying. Have you painted a lot of portraits of lighthouses? Is that a favorite subject? The only one I did was the one that's in the head. <laughs> uh, years ago in the 60s, I painted a headshot. It was a 16 by 20, and, but it was a, just a head portrait of a collie dog. Well, last year I painted one for my son, and the other son once went hit, but he's got a dog that's got more hair on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to paint. It's hard to fur. paint. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I did paint the ships I was on and different things, but mm-hmm. uh, it's just where uh, I did, I've done about 
geez, I got about half a dozen or so mountain suns scenes. I just mm-hmm. try and my first time with with a with a tool, paint. a blade kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, I've done a lot of, but my kids and family have got that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I like it. That's good. That's a that's a, an important to have an interest outside of your main interest. I think, and something artistic is is very healthy for the mind. I think. Yeah. I yeah. Think so. yeah. So I have one final question for you, Gene. This is for bonus points, okay? Okay. You're right. Okay. Question is, what has been your favorite thing about your association with the Coast Guard Museum North Northwest? Or things. It could be more than one. Well, it hasn't been interviews. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just just in informing people about the Coast Guard. Mm-hmm. And and uh, given the background and what they do and what we did, it's it's like uh, I was at Safeway recently and some guy had uh, Navy on his hat and he got to talk to me and he's talking about Navy. He said, "Were you in the service?" I said, "Coast Guard." Oh, the shallow water sailors, huh? And I said, "Geez, the first time I went aboard, I went twelve or two, over two thousand miles to between Greenland and Iceland in February." Is that shallow water up there? And he shut up. <laughs> but half of the Navy guys have never been to sea anyway. Well, one thing I can certainly say about the museum and Gene specifically is he understates his role significantly and has been a very, very important resource for history of the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. Lighthouse Service in the Pacific Northwest. I've been here dozens of times and he has been a resource to get bits of information that aren't available in other places and Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you for that because you have helped me out many many times well thank you Chad you still don't get the lens (laughs) (laughs) that obviously wasn't my goal but uh... So, Gene Davis, thank you so much for everything today. This is a a rare privilege to meet you and to be at this museum. Uh, And uh, as Chad just said, you've done so much for the Coast Guard and uh, for this region and for people interested in the Coast Guard. So uh, this is just a great day, and I really appreciate you hosting us here today. Thank you. We're happy to have you. For information on the Coast Guard Museum Northwest, visit coastguardmuseumseattle.org. I'd like to mention some other things in the museum that we didn't talk about in the interview. Michelle, please help me with this list. Sure. Other things in the museum include a piece of the HMS Bounty and a piece of the USS Constitution. There's the ship's bell from the steam tug Roosevelt, Admiral Peary's ship during his quest for the North Pole. There's a sextant from the U-boat U-873 captured by the Coast Guard during World War II. There are items from the German trawler Exernstein, which was captured off Greenland in World War II. The museum has the largest public collection of Coast Guard patches, over 3,000 books and periodicals covering Coast Guard and Northwest Maritime history, and over 2,500 historical documents, clippings, and vessel plans. The museum and Gene Davis are national treasures, and I won't forget my visit there. Thanks again to Gene and to Chad Kaiser for making the interview possible. Be sure to check out uslhs.org to learn more about everything the U.S. Lighthouse Society offers. And remember that donations and memberships help to support this podcast. You know, I was just thinking about how we have never read the Society's mission statement on the podcast. So here it is. Quote, The mission of the United States Lighthouse Society is to preserve and share the history and legacy of America's lighthouses and their keepers, unquote. And then there's also a vision statement. Yes, here's the vision statement, quote, to be a beacon to the American lighthouse community, providing steadfast guidance and resources on heritage, education, preservation, and all things lighthouse, end quote. Of course, this podcast shares those same goals. In every episode, we're working to keep alive the great history and legacy of our lighthouses and the people who kept them. That includes the actual lighthouse keepers and their families, and of course, it also includes people like Gene Davis. Do you have a quote about history, Michelle? I do, Jeremy. Winston Churchill once said, quote, History will be kind to me, for I intend to write it, end quote. 
I think Churchill was joking when he said that, but I, I also think you can look at it in another way. All of us are creating history, kind of writing history every day. So in a sense, uh, we're all writing the history that people will study in the future. We all need to pay attention to the legacy we're leaving, I think in big ways and small ways every day. On that note, to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. Shine.